Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Irrigation Essentials, Basics, Biology, and Best Practices. I am Matthew J. Grassi. I'm the new editor of Greenhouse Management Magazine. So glad you could take the time and join us today for this presentation. In this webinar, we will be having a conversation with Shay Donald, a field technician for the Professional Technical Services Horticulture Department, as well as his teammate Marisol Camacho, irrigation layout and design engineer, both of whom are with the Hawthorne Gardening Company. Just we're going to learn a little bit more today about mastering proper irrigation in greenhouse facilities. Before we do get started, I have a few housekeeping notes to go over. Number one, this webinar is being recorded and it will be available in a few days on our website. Secondly, we will have a Q&A period um, we will have time for your questions at the end of this webinar, so please submit all of your questions at any time during the presentation by using the Q&A function that's uh, at the bottom of the window there in your Zoom taskbar. One more quick housekeeping note, the views expressed during this webinar are those of the speaker, our speakers, and not necessarily of Greenhouse Management Magazine or GIE Media. This webinar does not constitute an endorsement of the vendor or speaker's views, products, services, or advice. Now, I am pleased to introduce today's speakers, Shay Donald and Marisol Camacho. First about Shay, Shay is a field technician for the Professional Technical Services Horticulture Department at Hawthorne Gardening Company. Shay has a background in green horse horticulture technology um, he manages the design and construction of vegetable production facilities across, Brit across British Columbia, and he's joining us today from Vancouver. Marisol has been with HGC for about six months and previously had a year of experience in kitchen ventilation. She graduated from Oregon State University Cascades with a degree in energy systems engineering, which is the multidisciplinary degree. It combines uh, aspects of mechanical, electrical, and industrial engineering courses, and then with a focus on energy and developing a systems approach to solving problems. Her role and background has allowed Marisol to sharpen this holistic mindset because while her focus is primarily on irrigation, she also does benching and lighting design for greenhouse facilities and really all indoor ag facilities as well. Marisol recognizes the importance of understanding the impacts that changes, no matter how big or small in your growing environment can have on your irrigation system and more importantly, on your plants. So that's just a little bit about our two panelists today that you'll be hearing from. Now we're gonna get into the meat and potatoes of the presentation. So I uh, throw it over to Shay and we'll get started. Okay, so question number one, what is drought stress and how does it affect crop development? Awesome, thanks Matthew and thanks for the introduction. So I guess starting out, um, yeah, we wanna talk about drought stress and what that means to growers big and small. So it, drought stress is a general term um, that can mean quite a few things, but overall it's just when a plant doesn't have enough water to maintain its physiological processes. And so it might start shutting things down in order to prevent an excess loss of moisture. So kind of the symptoms that you might see in a plant or in a crop are fairly familiar to even non-growers because as a plant has water loss that's excessive, um, as that's occurring, it's losing water in its vacuoles when it, within its cells. And that starts to drop the, what's called the turgor pressure that keeps plants upright. So it's a fairly familiar thing to see is a plant that's drooping, its leaves are facing downwards as it loses that force that's keeping the leaves upright. So there's a number of things that are happening on the cell level as this is going on. Um, on plants' leaves, they have stomatal openings that open and close to allow water vapor to escape as well as oxygen. 
um, but it also brings carbon dioxide into the leaf, which is essential for photosynthesis. So as the plant realizes, oh, I, I don't have enough water to keep things going, I, it shuts down those stomatal openings. It shuts them to try and prevent that water loss. It can't completely prevent it, but it will slow it down, which also puts a stop on photosynthesis. So bringing this back around to growers, um, we obviously want to keep the plants photosynthesizing as much as possible. So for growers, professional and amateur alike, um, you don't want your plant to experience this drought stress uh, because that's going to reduce the photosynthesis, which is gonna reduce your yield potential. And for greenhouse growers, that means lost dollars. Um, you don't wanna be keeping your lights and fans and everything running while your plants are just sitting there trying desperately not to lose water. So that's kind of an acute drought stress situation. That's where the plant hasn't adapted to what's going on at the root zone. It's just been exposed to extremely dry conditions and it's trying really hard not to, to die basically. Um, but over time, because plants are, are smart, uh, you know, they, they are able to adapt to their conditions because they don't have the luxury of picking up their roots and moving 20 feet closer to a stream. Um, so in a natural environment, they have to change the way that they use water in order to adapt to those drier conditions. And so this is something that is a bit more nefarious and something that we really want to push and, and talk about today is, um, just because your crop looks okay, and it looks like everything's growing well, that your plants could still be experiencing drought stress. Um, it's just that they have adapted to it now, and they do things like they reduce the number of stomatal openings on their leaves, they produce smaller leaves, um, and ultimately it, again, reduces your yield potential, and it reduces the amount of photosynthesis that's going on day to day. So if you have a crop that is consistently exposed to just minor drought stress conditions, you end up with a crop that might look um, subjectively fine, but it's actually growing smaller and producing less yield overall. And that's, that's kind of what we're all about and what we're all about preventing <laughs> is we want our plants just drinking like crazy and therefore growing like crazy. That's ideal. Interesting, Shai. As you noted, we want to avoid this uh, end of end of the year yield hit. So yeah, limiting drought stress is super important. Um, so, so guys, what factors into irrigation system planning? I, I feel like this question will be a perfect fit for Marisol in her uh, systems approach and kind of having an all encompassing approach to to a project. Yeah, so this question really, it touches on a lot of different things. So really, you know, whether you're greenhouse or you're, you know, completely indoors, um, hydroponics, hydroponic growing really does require a holistic approach. Um, so the various inputs in the growing environment will have an impact on the irrigation system and its needs, but ultimately, you know, everything is intertwined. So they're all going to affect each other um, in different ways. So one of the biggest things is going to be lights in the, your growing environment. Um, switching the type of light or switching the type of photo period of light or the length of photo period of light in a greenhouse or indoor facility will ultimately impact the environment. Um, for example, a big thing is switching from uh, high pressure sodium lights uh, to LEDs. So switching to LED lights um, actually reduces the amount of radiant heat available to the plant and it will ultimately infect um, evap evapotranspiration rates. Another thing that can infect uh, your plant is the amount of plant biomass or the pruning techniques used um, across different high uh, value crops, vegetables, hemp, et cetera. Um, this decreases the thermal mass that's ultimately available um, and will impact the airflow that's moving through both the, beneath the canopy and above. Um, it's also decreasing the surface area available for transpiration, as I mentioned up before. And also different types of plants are all gonna have different um, ideal irrigation parameters. So you're going to need to adjust depending on the type of crop that you're growing, but ultimately the type of species you are as well. And you know, this is a big part of, um, I think hydroponic growing is that we don't know everything about different types of plants and how they truly behave and what are the different buttons that can kind of push them into the next stage of growth. 
Um, and then another big thing is going to be the impact on your heating and cooling. So when you are irrigating and you are doing small and frequent uh, irrigation events, you're gonna put a lot less stress on your HVAC equipment versus if you're doing um, very infrequent, larger uh, volume irrigation events. So instead of putting a bunch of water into the room at one time, you're putting a little bit incrementally over time and putting less stress on your system. And then another huge part, as we can all imagine, is what's going on at the plant. Um, there is the media type that you decide to pick and then also the pot size. Um, as we have seen, um, in hydroponic growing, three of the most popular growing medias are gonna be coco coir, rock wool, and peat. And so these all have different benefits, but they also all require different irrigation strategies. And that's important to consider. Um, you shouldn't be watering six inch rock wool cubes the same as like five gallons of coco coir. So a really important part of it. And um, I'm gonna hit a little bit on kind of the, the benefits of each of these um, growing medias, and then also the irrigation strategies you could use. So first we have coco coir. As many people know, it holds moisture really well. It, allow, it allows for a lot of oxygenation and it's really easy to use. It's very user-friendly. Um, and if it's uh, properly treated prior to use within the manufacturing um, process, um, it's gonna be great for your plants. Uh, it retains water for a long period of time and can handle fewer, fewer irrigation events and it can handle you know, potentially missing an irrigation event or any mistakes that a new grower may make. Um, and this also has um, the second most aeration available to the plant next to rock wool. So going into rock wool, um, as mentioned, it has the most aeration available. Um, it also, it does require a high level of skill to efficiently irrigate. Um, and that's where people can kind of get messed up using rock wool, especially if they're new to growing on a larger scale. And Lastly, it's also not the most sustainable growing media. So that's a kind of potential downside of choosing rock wool. And then we, ha we have peat last. Peat is very, very easy to use. As we've seen, it's available in a lot of consumer grade soils that are out there. However, um, with all the positives it does have, it is a little bit more application specific. Um, it cannot be as well suited for higher intensity crops um, because of the potential for um, oversaturation of water. And then lastly, we have pot size. Um, bigger pots are gonna require less frequent irrigation events, and, but it is gonna be harder to control the moisture content available. And also there is, a potential for, there is potential for a greater margin of error in terms of if you water a little bit too much, it's probably gonna be okay. Versus if you have a smaller pot, um, overwatering can have a much more severe impact on the plant health throughout the growth cycle. Um, and then small pots obviously yield themselves really well to the strategy of pulse irrigation. And it's really good, it's really easy to maintain moisture and aeration in the root zone when you're putting in a lot of smaller um, irrigation events. Um, as a team at Hawthorne, we always strive to design our systems um, with consideration to all these factors and to allow for flexibility within your system. Um, we wanna make sure that, you know, if you decide to expand by, you know, adding a couple more plants to each of your rooms, we're gonna be able to handle that. Um, and that's a really important part of planning your irrigation system. And we'll get a little bit more into this as we get further into the webinar. Great stuff there, Marisol. Um, you kind of touched on it a little bit there at the end, but are there some preventative measures that, that growers and, and their team should be keeping in mind during the design process when they're designing the irrigation system that they want to use in the greenhouse? to account for potential changes down the road, such as maybe going from HPS to LED, or maybe adding some additional acreage that you hadn't planned on originally, but you wanna scale up and expand. Any, any high level thoughts there that, that you guys can share with us? I guess there's a wealth of problems, unfortunately, that you could have in a, in a growing facility. So, I mean, I'll just touch on some of the, you know, I guess the most common ones we see one of the first things is the improperly sized equipment or placed equipment. Um, and it, within that also designing for redundancy. Uh, if you have a pump for each different room per se in some indoor facility, uh, you'll be able to accommodate any potential um, addition of more plants versus if you have you know, only two pumps handling like six rooms, um, there as many pumps or as many um, pieces of equipment. Here, I'm actually gonna pause there, sorry. <laughs> that didn't flow out very well. Um, 
Another potential issue of poorly designed irrigation systems is going to be improperly sized or placed equipment, whether that be pumps, pipes, filters, or valves. And it's also going to be uh, designing for redundancy. It's really important to account for, um, oh my gosh, sorry, I have to start over. That just is not flowing out very well. <laughs> There are a lot of common issues that can potentially show up um, in a drip irrigation system. One of them, many of them can be due to improperly sized or placed equipment, such as pumps, pipes, filters, and valves. Um, we could also see signs in terms of um, fungus gnats or different types of pests that are um, present because of an excess amount of water. Um, and then we could also see unwanted plant stress and stress plants are more susceptible to pests and they're more susceptible um, to just all the environmental factors as they become more stressed out. Uh, specifically, some of the things that we definitely do as designers is we always aim to um, design redundant systems. So we wanna make sure that we have enough pumps to cover any potential expand, or we have large enough pumps that can cover any potential addition of plants and any increases in flow rates. It's also important to introduce automation and monitoring into your system. Um, this can help you keep track and have real time data showing um, that you are delivering the proper amount of water and types of nutrients to your plants. And I can, I'm gonna leave this open for Shay to answer some, add some quick tidbits too. Um, yeah, so some preventative items that Maddie still touched on. Um, we, we tend to want to allow growers the flexibility to, you know, if they want to change their planting density down the road or modify their irrigation scheduling or, or strategies that they have the the control aspect and, and the ability to do so. Um, and so, like Maddie Sol mentioned, um, we would try and include some kind of baked in um, wiggle room, so to speak, in, in the design, uh, whether it's slightly oversizing pipes, I think is fairly common so that it can handle a higher flow rate down the road, um, or having a larger pump or something that has a variable frequency drive that allows it to maintain the pressure that's needed because one of the biggest um, issues that, that we see are commonly improperly sized items like that. And what happens is it might work today, but as soon as you change a factor or change something in your growing style down the road, then you're going to have problems. So just trying to account for that on the front end and also understand that growers do like to change these things and, and kind of play around with stuff is, is what we try to incorporate into any of our recommendations or any of our work. Um, I would say also another big thing too is um, getting a grasp of uh, the facility as well. Um, understanding where the water is actually coming into your building and making sure that when you're sizing those pumps that you're accounting for any potential pressure loss um, over those lengths. And there's a lot of different things. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, and just adding to that too, just how much water do they have access to? You know, we've had situations where people have to drill extra wells, for example, or go to the city and get a increase, which is probably fairly common among some of the viewers today. So, and water quality as well. That's another part as well. And especially mm -hmm. as, um, people are growing in different parts of the country. It's important to understand what types of minerals and things are in your water so that you can properly um, clean it before it goes to your plants. So guys, it sounds like there's there's a lot of variables there, a lot of moving parts where it, it behooves you as a grower to have some a team of experts kind of on your side, helping you through this process and making sure you're planning for what you need down the road. Um, you know, we, we've touched on a few different production systems, a few different growing styles. For greenhouse growing specifically, how is irrigation different when you're, when you're deploying it within a greenhouse versus another type of indoor facility? And what are some of the common issues or problems that you see typically in a greenhouse operation that, that's adding irrigation in? Yeah, so greenhouse is pretty interesting because um, you know, I had someone tell me that, you know, greenhouse growing is kind of like 
regular agriculture, but for control freaks. And <laughs> I think that's, that's kind of true because you, you take all these things that in an agricultural setting, you have no control over, um, you know, your soil type to some degree, the temperature, the humidity, the wind, those are all things you have to contend with. Um, whereas in a greenhouse or an indoor setting, which takes it kind of to the next extreme, um, you get to control all those items, you know, to some degree. So when you have to deal with irrigation in a greenhouse setting, um, it's going to be different than in a field as well as indoor. Uh, and compared to in a field, uh, you know, your, your crops have essentially an unlimited amount of room for their roots to grow into. And so you can get away with not irrigating for sometimes multiple days and the crops are going to do just fine. Um, and in fact, a lot of what irrigation management is in a field versus in a greenhouse or indoor is just accounting for, you know, what you get from the rain, um, your soil type, the environmental conditions and things like that. And um, there's, there's a lot more buffer there and a lot more room for you to take time and make those decisions. Uh, in a greenhouse setting, when you're growing in soilless media, especially, um, now you don't have the luxury of that time. And what you need to do with this reduced uh, root ball without, with this lower amount of volume for the roots to grow into, you need to increase the frequency of your irrigations significantly. Um, now in a greenhouse compared to an indoor setting, indoor setting, it's kind of, you know, you have great big HVAC systems and, and the goal is to keep your environment bang on exactly the same throughout the entire day. That kind of makes things a bit easier because now you just, you can say, I want to irrigate every 30 minutes and give it 200 mils and just do that all day, starting two hours after your lights turn on, for example. In a greenhouse, there's going to be some compounding factors such as, you know, light levels um, and the humidity and temperature, which you have some control over, but it's not going to be that perfect, perfect control that you see in an idealized indoor setting. So what a lot of modern uh, controllers do, environmental controllers for greenhouses, they kind of factor a lot of those things in automatically. Um, obviously, the grower still has to make a lot of decisions on the front end about what those parameters are going to be. Um, but a lot of it is just through these very complex systems that exist um, that assist growers with making those decisions. And, and I think one of the most um, recent ad additions to this is kind of the, uh, there's been a lot of sensing soil moisture sensing technology that's kind of taking off in soilless media these days, which is very exciting because now, you know, that's the most direct way to tell how much water is my plant getting is, well, how much water is there? You can indirectly monitor it by looking at things like, like I was saying, light, humidity, et cetera. Um, but this allows you to really get the plant eye view, so to speak. And just, just to add to that um, really quickly, uh, doing your irrigation scheduling using sensors, um, the sensor-based set point irrigation really has the potential to reduce your water volume significantly in your operation. And despite also the low cost of water, um, there are a lot of potential economic benefits that may result um, from this in terms of reduced labor, um, fertilizer requirements, and then disease control. Interesting, guys. It sounds like uh, using some of these advanced high-tech EC and soil, soil moisture sensors are, are, is something more advanced greenhouse growers are, are doing today. Um, are there any other advanced irrigation techniques that, that you're seeing from a lot of greenhouse operations that, that are working well? Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's very interesting because I think a lot of the studies going on nowadays, it's, it's really you want to be able to give your crop the least amount of water possible while still maintaining that yield that's, that's desired. Because sustainability is going to be the number one issue you know, moving forward for a lot of folks. And I think water use is going to be front of mind for, for that as well. Um, and so, you know, actually utilizing drought stress itself is something that is also um, already being done in a lot of vegetable crops, for example. 
um, crop steering. Uh, if, if anyone is familiar with like tomato, cucumber, pepper production, that's sort of um, growing. You're, you've got an indeterminate plant that wants to both be producing vegetative leaves as well as productive generative fruits. And so how growers kind of tell the plant, um, hey, you should be producing more leaves or more uh, fruits. Uh, one, of the, one of the largest tools or, or most immediate tools that growers have in their belt is uh, through irrigation scheduling. Um, and so this is called crop steering. I'm not sure if I mentioned it before, but, um, and what you can do is essentially by delaying your irrigation a little bit in the morning, adjusting a few key environmental factors, um, you can sort of signal the plant that uh, it might be receiving less water moving forward. And so it kind of activates some of those processes we were talking about earlier, but without really reducing the photosynth photosynthetic um, ability of the plant. That's the ideal. So by kind of running things drier, so to speak, you signal to the plant to produce more fruit. Whereas if you have more of a well-saturated, consistently moist media, then the plant kind of thinks, hey, I can relax a bit and start producing more leaves. Um, so that's one of the key tools, but, but there are, I think, going to be many more moving forward. And this application, I believe, will extend to other crops. Um, there are a lot of um, studies that have been done on crops that produce um, essential oils and especially terpene type volatile chemicals um, that humans might find desirable because we can extract that and it smells nice. And you know, there's a lot of crops out there, even medicinal ones that that, that is beneficial. And there have been studies that show that if you kind of drought stress the plants towards the end of their production cycle, that they might produce more of these chemicals. Sometimes they can be protective chemicals. And, and a lot of the reason that they're even being produced might not entirely be known yet. But again, I think that focusing on irrigation as a tool is um, extremely exciting. It's something I'm quite passionate about. Excellent. Marisol, anything to add to that or, or anything you wanted to say there? Um, well, all great points that Shay brought up. And um, also as a somebody with background in energy and sustainability, I really look forward to seeing the different advances and research that'll continue going into um, understanding how irrigation can really affect plant physiology and plant outputs. So. Excellent. Guys, we're coming up to the end of this presentation. This is, I feel like this has been a great use of everyone's time talking about something that, that maybe not as much emphasis is put on it as light selection or genetic selection or some of these things growers are very focused on when they're planting a crop, but just as important, obviously. Um, putting a bow on this whole presentation, how can, you, any, how can you avoid drought stress in the greenhouse? Yeah, so avoiding drought stress in the greenhouse, it starts from the pre-planning, right? It starts from when you're getting ready to construct your building. And what you have to do at that point is you got to choose the right partners um, because uh, you want someone that's not only going to understand irrigation um, and drought stress, but you want a partner who can kind of give you the whole holistic picture, um, connect the dots, connect things to your growing media, your growing style, your crop, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and ideally someone who is going to be there when they hand you the keys. Um, and this is, you know, selfishly the plug for Hawthorne because that's exactly what we do. Um, we have a team that myself and Maddie Soler are a part of that's made up of horticulturists, uh, mechanical engineers, lighting and electrical engineers, as well as design and technical support that really brings all those dots together, uh, whether it's a greenhouse, indoor or outdoor application. Um, we're here to assist growers uh, to get the maximum yield and the best possible crop that they can. Really well sums it up, Shay. And I just like to add to that is that, you know, throughout the whole design process and project process, we're here um, before and we're here after. And even if we don't have a solution um, for everything, we're here to make sure that it will um, integrate with anything else that you choose and that everything will work in unison. 
Okay, that does it for the presentation uh, segment of our of our talk here. Now we're going to open it up to audience question and answer. So if you had any questions for Shay or Marisol that you wanted to get an answer for today, go ahead and type those into the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your Zoom window there and hit submit and we will start answering some questions.